Coming up on DTNS, the attack on Okta might not be as bad as it first looked. Roku has new features, but do we care about TV platforms anymore? And why Apple isn't getting into routers or smart home stuff at all. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And joining us from the Addition newsletter, Charlotte Henry. Welcome back. Hello. This is exciting. It's the first time anyone's ever introduced me from that now because many oh, babies really? out in the world. Yes, hello. I feel so honored. Yeah. Feel uh, honored congrats on going indie. That's great. Yes, going Yes, a bit like you know, one of those bands you see at a lo-fi group mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, well, you left <laughs> the, uh, the you left the super group. Yeah, and and, and gone solo. It's well, fantastic. Or is this the super group? That's the question. Perhaps it is. You're definitely um, is now a, a guest on stage at our concert. This That's, is the point. Before we break this metaphor, uh, let's start with a few tech things you should know. <laughs> At the AI conference, and NVIDIA, GTC, NVIDIA, unsurprisingly, made a bunch of AI announcements. The next generation of the Hopper GPU architecture is optimized for AI. The Hopper H100 will be the first card on the platform, promising to speed up transform and machine learning model training by six to nine times. Also, NVIDIA announced the Grace CPU superchip with 144 ARM cores and a terabyte of secondary memory, both of these chips are meant for data centers. And if you use them together, you have a Grace Hopper system in honor of the pioneering computer scientist. I like that. The Omniverse collaborative design tool is now available in the cloud. A product called DriveMap will be available for the automated vehicle industry with ground truth mapping of more than 300,000 miles of roads in North America, Europe, and Asia by 2024. And NVIDIA is selling its Jetson AGX Orin developer kit for powering robotics for $1,999. Finally, NVIDIA announced it plans to build the world's fastest AI supercomputer called EOS, promising 275 petaflops of compute. A security researcher who goes by Mr. Docs, with a zero, of course, in the docs, has uh, showed a proof of concept phishing technique you should be aware of. He was able to use HTML and CSS to replicate the pop-up you would get from a third-party sign-in from a reputable company like Google or Microsoft. You know, when it says sign in with Google, you click on it, you get a little pop-up. Because it's an embedded element, not an actual pop-up from those companies, you can make it look like the URL is accurate because you're creating it. It's basically a, an interactive image. So just checking the URL would be not enough for you to detect that there is a phishing attempt in process. You can tell it's a fake pop-up if you try to resize it or move it out of the browser window because it's an embedded element, it can't leave the browser. Ars Technica notes that the technique has been seen once in the wild in 2020 in an attempt to steal Steam credentials. Netflix is adding more games to its streaming service, just a few, but still, the library grows, including educational game This is a True Story about water scarcity in sub-Saharan Africa, and Shatter Remastered, which is a mobile version of the brick-breaking game Shatter. Netflix also says that Into the Dead 2 Unleashed, a sequel to the zombie action game, is coming soon, later this month. Alphabet announced it's spinning Sandbox off into an independent company, not taking it from one part of Alphabet into another, but kicking it out of Alphabet altogether. Uh, Alphabet's quantum technology group called Sandbox was launched in 2016 by Jack Hittery, and since then has functioned as a separate group from Alphabet X. A lot of times they, they incubate these things in the X labs, Alphabet X, and then make them separate Alphabet companies. That's what happened with Sandbox. Uh, but now they're not just spinning it out of X into other bets, they're spinning it out of Alphabet entirely. Hittery will stay on as CEO of the new independent company Sandbox AQ and its 55 employees. Last week, Google announced that Steam was coming to Chromebooks as an alpha test. There was a lot of interest, but not a lot of details. Now Google is releasing instructions on how to get Steam running on Chrome OS. For now, only a handful of devices are supported, and they'll need Intel Iris Z graphics, 11th generation Core i5 or i7 processors, and at least 8 gigs of RAM. If your Chromebook is supported, Google says you'll need to switch your Chromebook to the dev channel, enable a special flag in Chrome, type a few commands into Chrome OS's cross terminal, but then you can uh, give it a whirl. 
All right, let's talk about this uh, this big data breach. There's a couple of them actually out there, Sarah. What do we got? All right, so the same data extortion group that went after NVIDIA, went after Samsung and other companies is now claiming to have breached Microsoft and identity and access management company Okta. Let's start with Okta. The company provides software and services to keep employee logins secure for things like single sign-on. Clients include FedEx, T-Mobile, HPE, JetBlue, Siemens, Sterling Bank, big, big companies, and there are others. The attackers claim to have gained super user admin access to Okta.com, and they posted screenshots on Telegram of what they allege are some of Okta's customer data, as well as its backend admin console. Okta Chief Security Officer David Bradbury wrote in a blog post that there was a five-day window of time between January 16th and January 21st, 2022, it's just a couple months ago, where an attacker had access to a support engineer's laptop. This is consistent with the screenshots. He says the company terminated the compromised user's active sessions, suspended the account, kind of the end of it. But Bradbury also wrote, these engineers are unable to create or delete users or download customer databases. Support engineers do have access to limited data, and for example, Jira tickets and lists of users that were seen in the screenshots. Support engineers are also able to facilitate the resetting of passwords and MFA factors for users, but are unable to obtain those passwords. Okta CEO Todd McKinnon says there's no evidence of ongoing malicious activity. The worry was whether the attackers had gained access to client systems through Okta. Sounds like Okta is pretty confident that they had not, but that was the worry. The same malicious group also claims it breached Microsoft's Azure DevOps server. The group leaked 37 gigabytes of source code that appears to include code for Bing, Cortana, compliance engineering, and some other Microsoft projects. Doesn't contain references to Windows or Office products specifically. But the group also claimed to have breached LG Electronics for the second time. Yeah, so uh, to kind of knock off some of the, the usual questions about this, uh, Okta is continuing to investigate. When they discovered it in January, they immediately contacted affected clients and have been working with them. The only reason this became public is because the group uh, was claiming responsibility for it. Uh, they don't believe that there was any access. In fact, this 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 laptop uh, that that the, the group got into didn't have the authorization to access anything. Like Sarah said, they could only send reset commands. They didn't actually see any of the personal information or, or were able to log into personal information. Uh, so it does seem like Okta acted responsibly uh, and, and that this was a limited uh, attack. And the buzz amongst security researchers out there is that this particular group really is just buying people off. Uh, they're, they're going and paying disgruntled engineers or, or sympathetic engineers uh, in order to get access. Uh, and, and that would make sense, given that this was a third party support engineer. I feel reassured having sort of read those comments, because when I first saw this story this morning, my time in the UK, I went, uh oh, this yeah. doesn't sound good. This sounds like someone's going to get access to lots of different services. Not just you know, because because of the nature of Okta as a business, it, my worry was we were going to suddenly see a whole load of you know repercussions from this. But actually, right. reading that blog post from the chief security officer at Okta, um, kind of you know, if we take we have to for the time being take that at face value, and seeing that makes you think, okay, they've kind of been pretty transparent. They're not pretending there's no issue, but they've, you know, explained how that issue is contained and how they've discovered it. I guess the question might be, why did it take from January the 21st or whatever it was to March the 22nd for this to become public? But as general, it seems to me Okta has uh, behaved kind of in the way we would want a company to in these circumstances and that actually... The initial fears that we all had when we were reading about it, about the kind of knock-on effect seem like they've been contained. Yeah, uh, I, I, I think the reason Okta didn't make it public is possibly because the clients didn't want it to be public yeah. and there wasn't any personal information accessed. If it turns out personal information was accessed, then they're in violation of GDPR and a bunch of other stuff. So I feel like they they were following client wishes and the law and only because this group made it public were they like, okay, fine, we will tell you as much to come 
calm you down as possible. Because I was like you, Charlotte, when I first saw this, I'm like, ooh, man, if they were able to get into FedEx and HPE and all these other companies, you know, this, Starling this could Bank, spread really fast. Bank, one of them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it, it could have been could have been really bad. So I went from kind of going, oh, my goodness, is this Marriott or whatever else to, okay, no, they seem to have behaved sensibly, which, I mean, given the kind of nature of their business, you would both hope and expect. Yeah. Uh, well, let's move on to some sunnier news. Although that wasn't terribly cloudy. Uh, Roku is fast becoming an advertising company as its revenue for ads continues to grow while its platform business levels off. The Roku Channel app, for instance, is available well outside of Roku's ecosystem on Amazon's Fire OS, on iOS, on Android, Android TV, Samsung TVs have it and more. That audience is growing for Roku and they're making money off of selling ads on it. On the other hand, more people are tending to use just smart TV interfaces for streaming. Uh, though in some TVs that is Roku OS, people just aren't buying the dongles and the set-top boxes. And of course, Roku still wants to improve its platform. They're not resting just on the advertising revenue yet. So let's look at what's new in Roku OS 11. You can change your screensaver to use your own photos. The feature is called Photo Streams, and it can connect to your desktop or a mobile device and you can even share your streams with other Roku users. Like maybe you have some family members, then you can all collaborate on a shared stream and add photos to it. Uh, there's a new speech clarity setting for dialogue, uh, making dialogue clear. Uh, and for people who use Roku streaming or speaker devices, uh, like the, their surround sound, their sound bar, uh, there's new sound modes, uh, standard dialogue, movie, music, and night modes. Roku's mobile app will now show more info on TV shows and movies, including where you can stream them for free and any existing paid accounts you have if you can stream them there. A new what to watch on Roku section in the home screen menu will suggest popular and recently released stuff. Uh, voice enabled keyboards are getting Spanish, German, and Portuguese support. None of these are the kinds of features where you're like, I've changed my mind. I've got to buy a Roku device, even though I have a Samsung TV. Uh, how do we feel, Charlotte, about Roku OS 11 and just the future of streaming platforms in general? It feels like they're becoming kind of commoditized. Uh, I feel exactly that, how you just said. I have two Samsung TVs in my apartment. Um, none of them have anything, any dongles or stuff plugged into them. Um, I do have a cable box in one of them, but everything all the streaming services i use um just you know the tv os that's within the samsung televisions um yeah in fact the only example where i have to use something different is when i have to plug my mac mini into one of the tvs because it doesn't have an apple tv plus app but um i think actually we're going to see that this is a bit like mobile phones right and people don't want lots of stuff and peripherals and actually if you own you have to own the actual hardware in this case the television and so if you want people to use your streaming platform to access even other services you're going to have to build the tv as well yeah i've got a i've got an older samsung tv it's it's right it's 10 years old now but it has some smart uh, capabilities, uh, and I thought, oh, that's kind of fun, you know, when I first got it. But no, I'm going to use my Apple TV. That's 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 how I do everything. You know, I, I don't want to build all this into some TV because then when I have to replace the TV, then I don't have kind of my yeah. my setup on, you know, some separate system. But more and more, uh, particularly recently, uh, you know, I've had friends who... Because people are always saying, Sarah, you know, you watch all, you know, the streaming stuff. Like, how do you, how do you get in everything? And... And, you know, as, as people continue to, you know, cut cords and figure out what the best situation is, uh, more and more, I don't totally know what, I don't know how to tell them not to use these apps on their televisions because they've gotten so much better. And it's hard to convince somebody to, to buy a separate hardware device. I mean, some people want that for sure. But I think more and more, it's just like, oh, well, TVs are smart. So you just figure out something like the Roku platform within this TV, because if it's new enough, it would support that. I yeah. think this is a highway headed for pain because I have a 16 year old Samsung TV that has no connectivity, but I'm able to use Apple TV, Roku, Android TV on it. And I do, I think the people, I think you're right. People are buying TVs and just thinking like, hey, it's got a smart thing built into it. I'll just use that. 
But down the road, that's going to stop getting updates. Apps aren't going to be available for it because they can't run on that platform. And then people are going to have to get into the dongle market again. Well, and if something goes wrong, that's a much more expensive uh, replacement. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I'm an Apple TV user. I, I have a Roku. I, I haven't used it in quite some time just because almost all the apps that I care about are on both platforms. And I just chose one some mm. time ago. But, uh, you know, even an Apple TV, which is not, you know, it's not a drop in the bucket, uh, is still not the same thing as a twelve hundred dollar television. No, but of course they those. I mean, Apple hasn't. You know, these boxes do get updated and can go out of date. And you know, any of these companies who are making these apps could go. No, we're only making it available on this platform, not this platform. It's not particularly in there to their advantage to do so at the moment. The general pattern we're seeing is that people who have streaming services want those services to be in as many places as possible. Um, but, you know, if you're buying into any one thing, you're always slightly susceptible to that in an ecosystem, aren't you? Yeah. And, and there's always the stories of like, oh, the Netflix app doesn't work on the first gen of Roku anymore. Oh, now it doesn't work on the second gen of Roku mm. anymore because the DRM system can't be supported on that chip. Feel like we're headed towards something like that with TVs. In a so what's going to happen is I'm going to have to splash out on a new TV to, soon, and Tom's going to be sitting there going, "Ha ha! I've got my 16 year old box TV and <laughs> no, a nice just, new box." Just get a so, Chromecast yeah. or something. You don't yeah. have to buy a whole new TV, but but people are going to have to realize that, yeah. Well, Wired has an article out today about yet another attempt to make smart glasses. Although this one's a little different. Mm. Nemo is a full mini computer that's contained in the glasses frames themselves. It runs a modified version of Android. doesn't have Google Play Store support, but it does support Android apps, so you can run browsers, Microsoft Office, things like that. It also uses a Snapdragon XR1 processor. Importantly, there's no official tethering that is required, and that's something that Nemo touts. But if you want to connect to the internet, you would need a solution. So Bluetooth would connect you to a mouse and keyboard, for example. You can also use Bluetooth to connect to a phone. Use that phone as a trackpad. Kind of cool. And it can detect your gaze, so you can tap on the side of the frames to select certain things. So uh, even if you're not tethered, there is some functionality there. The Nemo has dual 720p screens embedded into the sides of each lens that allow for up to six virtual screens. What you see is equivalent to up to 40 to 50 inch displays. So for people like me who need prescription lenses, and I wear contacts, so it's kind of my solution. But if you but if you don't and you need glasses, the company isn't offering lenses. You'd need an optometrist to make lenses that work in the device. Uh, you know, unless you've got another solution or you don't need glasses at all. No cameras built into the device. So this is not one of these, oh, okay, I'm going to go out and about and take photos and make people feel weird. Doesn't have speakers either. That is all stuff that you can tether to a Bluetooth device, uh, you know, and figure some stuff out, but it's not built into the glasses themselves. And Nemo makes a point to say, you know, that's not really the point of this. This is replacing some sort of portable laptop or something that you might use at a coffee shop or if you're on the move or you're on a train or you're uh, you know, at an airport. Battery life is 2.5 hours and it weighs 120 grams right now, although the Nemo team says they think they can get that down to 90 grams by the shipping date, which is set for the first half of 2023. Uh, we've got a little bit of time, but it will come, if all goes well, to India and US markets for $799. Oh, you lost me. Mm. <laughs> I was in I on know. this because I'm like, I saved oh, that little nugget for the end. It's it's not that different from a from a tablet. Uh, you know, you you where you're like, oh, I just need it for word processing and doing some productivity stuff, and and it's it's light and on the go. And I'm like, oh yeah, one of those mobile keyboards like people use, and, and a Bluetooth mouse. I'm sitting in the Sky Lounge at the airport. You know, I could see this being a business tool, and maybe that's the the enterprise price at seven hundred ninety nine dollars. They're expecting companies might drop that. But I'm not sure if I'm splashing out that much, although it is a you know, high-end tablet price, I guess, uh, just to try this out. What about you, Charlotte? So everything about smart glasses terrifies me. I felt a bit better when I read that they were not like, it was the Facebook ones that had um, pictures and video taking on it that freaked everyone out, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. That yeah. was a few months back. Well, um, even so Google obviously Glass before that. Exactly. Although they were fairly obvious when someone was wearing those, the Facebook ones and like these um, Nemo ones look exactly like 
pretty much like real eyeglasses. Um, uh, the Facebook ones too, if I recall, actually you could get a prescription in them, couldn't you? Like like you say, I'm wearing contact lenses. Um, so that would obviously be a solution. Um, I'm not totally sure with your argument, Tom, that a company would be happy to drop $800 instead of buying one of their high-powered executives a uh, tablet. I think probably the tablet is easier to justify and would go further than the few trips on a plane that may or not may sure. not still be happening. I'm just saying that the price point won't turn them away. They might still turn away from the practicality of it, but yeah. but but there's a confidentiality thing. Nobody can look over your shoulder at your screen mm -hmm. on this, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. they're on your face. Uh, it's more more productive because you have more screens. They're bigger screens, so maybe there's an argument there. I really like this concept though of saying, you know what? Let's take the technology we have right now and make glasses that work with that instead of promising something where the technology isn't there yet. There's a place for that. Microsoft, Magic Leap, they, they're all pushing that boundary and maybe someday one of them will get there. But I do like somebody saying, well, we've got technology that can work right now. What can we do with it? And, yeah. and this is obviously this is obviously a bit of a different play, isn't it, to the metaverse type of play totally. where it's like, we yeah. want you to be consumed in an alternative world. This is about doing more in the world yeah, that you're, you're reading in. some email and you right. have limited space and you can s sit up straight and look ahead that might be pretty nice depending on you know how your workflow goes and it, you know if you move around a lot i think that's sort of the key of this is mm. this is not something i want sitting comfortably at my own desk at home i just no. don't i don't need it and i kind of don't want it but if i were doing a lot more <sighs> mobile computing i could i could see where especially if you have yeah if you have limited space privacy know. maybe is an issue then something like this uh -oh. would be sarah tom's imagining sitting at his desk reading emails in his glasses no i'm i'm, I'm imagining <laughs> sitting here right now and instead of looking down to see the dock and you guys you just being in front of me and i can look straight at the camera all the time i mean the ergonomic factor of this should not be you know yeah. underestimated it's like people really yeah, do have, have have issues with this so that you know that that's another part of this where i go mm, still not crazy about the look of these glasses but i could chunky. see where it would be uh, a, a handy tool to have yeah might be a good travel tool might be even good at home who knows maybe i should try uh, folks, what do you think? Tell us in our Discord. You can join that by linking a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Earlier this week, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman made a plea for once instead of a prediction. He usually makes predictions, but this time he made a request. Uh, he argued that as part of Apple's revitalization of the Mac line, it should start making Wi-Fi routers again. If you don't recall, Apple launched the airport base station way back in 1999, and it kept making Wi-Fi airport models for 15 years until it disbanded the airport team in 2016 and discontinued the entire line for good in 2018. If you go to Apple to buy a router right now, you'll have to buy a Linksys mesh router with HomeKit support. That's what they sell on the Apple store. German argues that Apple could make routers easier to set up, easy to secure, he suggests you could build it into the HomePod, maybe, the HomePod Mini. Uh, Google already does this with its latest Nest routers, where it can have speakers that have the Wi-Fi built in. The next web's Callum Booth saw this and thought, I think I know why Apple doesn't do this. First, price. Apple always sells above the competitors, and the Linksys routers that Apple sells are $500 for a three-pack. More than that might be too steep even for Apple, Callum Booth argues. The other reason Booth gives is that Apple doesn't have the product line to go with it. He argues Google is successful at this because it has the Nest line. Smart cams, thermostats, Nest speakers, some with smart screens. Apple has none of that stuff, just the HomePod mini, and I guess maybe the Apple TV. In the end, Booth argues that Apple can't control the experience enough in a router to keep its reputation for ease of use. Routers are finicky. Networking is subject to all kinds of reasons for failure beyond a manufacturer's control. Anybody who's tried to troubleshoot a network connection knows it's really hard to figure out where the problem is coming from. And that makes kind of sense to me. But it does point out that Apple, while making a compelling platform in HomeKit to control your smart home devices, is not doing much to capture the smart home device market. 
Is that on purpose? Is this part of the pivot to services? Apple wants to be the platform, not the device maker? Or is this a blind spot for the company while they're pouring resources into cars and mixed reality? They're just leaving the smart home market on the table. Charlotte, what do you think? Yeah, there, there is something a bit disconnected about Apple's whole smart home play. I'll, I'll come on to the Reuters bit in a minute, but I think it's a very fair point to say, look, this ha is a company that has on its main platform, iOS, uh, a thing called home, as in we want our ph your phones to be a place where you control smart home devices, but we basically only make two of them, maybe one and a half. Now, I don't think Apple was ever going to be the company that makes, you know, the thermostats and light bulbs exactly and they sell some third party stuff i don't think you're ever going to get an apple security camera like a ring type thing i don't but i think it's um that there is a bit something a bit disjoint about it i think that is a fair point to make as for the router thing i think callum i mean i am always loath to disagree with mark german I think that's never a good bet to take. <laughs> it's a fool's errand. Yeah. yeah. Like, I just it's a pretty it's good not... track record. Yeah. Right. But I think the arguments put forward by Callum Booth are actually pretty compelling. That let's put it this way Does Apple want the genius bar taken up with people complaining about their router at home? You know, I have, uh, it's funny, before before the show, as I was thinking about this, I was like, wait, what did I do with my Airport Extreme that I had for years? And I'm actually looking at it right now, but it's not actually the, the, the router that I use anymore. But when troubleshooting needed to happen on the network that I was using, and it did occasionally, it was pretty intuitive. Uh, I see where this argument is going is if Apple can control, you know, you buy hardware from Apple, Apple's making plenty of hardware already. Sure, it's mm -hmm. trying to boost its services division, but there's, you know, lots of hardware products and you need networking products to go with those hardware products. But yes, if there's too much uh, propensity for failure, I could see where Apple's like, you know, it's just not worth it. You know, maybe uh, they, the support side of uh, their former networking products were just like, this is a nightmare and it just doesn't make sense anymore because other companies are doing it for cheaper and people don't care if Apple makes a router anymore. I think your point about intuition is actually a good one though, Sarah. And it's kind of the flip side to actually our argument, which is if you're Apple and you can go, well, everyone hates their Wi-Fi routers and it makes everyone mad, but we can do have the thing that makes everyone not mad at Wi-Fi routers. That's obviously a good win for Apple. I guess is the is the you know the return on that bet worth it? Right. Yeah. I I think that I buy Callum's argument that the complexity of supporting it might be keeping Apple away. I don't know that Apple cares about the price point. They, I'm I'm sure if if it cost a thousand dollars for a pack of three beautiful Apple Wi-Fi routers that were super easy to set up, Apple wouldn't yeah. blink at charging people yeah. that. Right on the mantle, you know, yeah. front but, and center. Let's look at them. But but honestly, uh, I I think I think yeah, it may be that they they just don't want to deal with the the complexity of that. Although. Eero has done a great job. I know they're owned by Amazon, but even before that, they, they had a great job of being easy to manage. They worked really well. I have them. I'm using them right they're, now. They're, they're specialist companies, aren't yeah. they? Yeah. And I, I almost feel like maybe Apple wanted to buy Eero and is hoping to buy somebody like them and bring I, I them was, in. Have, I was looking while you were introducing this segment. Didn't Apple used to stock Eero at the Apple store. I'm sure they I've did. been in an Apple store and seen Eero. As routine. soon as as soon as soon Amazon bought them, that, that, that stopped. That it stopped. got yanked. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. All right. Uh, let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes from Jeremy, uh, who listened to our conversation we had on the show yesterday about the new Mac Studio. What's going on with onboard storage? Jeremy says, heard a few people talk about this surprise expansion slots for SSDs in that new Mac Studio. The machine has the ability to have up to eight terabytes of storage. Does everybody really think that Apple would put that into one slot? It would be an incredibly expensive drive. 
especially compared to being able to get two smaller ones in the same machine. It also allows other machines to start with the same base SSD and then just add to the other slots to get the storage that the customer selects. Jeremy says, am I overthinking this? No, Jeremy, you're making complete sense. Uh, I think the the surprise wasn't so much that they were that there were slots in there. It was that Apple has gone out of their way to stop you from using them. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's, there's, they literally designed it in the worst way to to possibly upgrade, which maybe you could excuse of like, well, they just weren't designing it to make it easy to upgrade. But then there's software that actually prevents you from putting in your own SSD slots, uh, which is exceptionally uh, obfuscating. So it really does feel like, and and the policy from Apple is clearly uh, they they say on the site. These are not meant to be user upgradable. Uh, we're not providing upgrades. You should buy as much as you need from the start. And and from then on, it'll have to be external. So they really did design it not to be upgraded, even though they could be upgraded. I, I don't understand putting uh, impediments to people wanting to do this themselves. It's crazy. Hi, well, thanks, Jeremy. You Apple? Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, kind of been we, we we feel like we know apple at this point yeah uh, i'm not and, surprised yeah yeah put it that yeah way. the 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 limitations on purpose uh to save us from ourselves uh well thanks jeremy for the feedback do keep that feedback coming feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is the email address to send it to dog photos welcome Hello, Uno. Also, thanks to you, Charlotte Henry, for joining us today. I know you've got some new stuff in the works. Let folks know where they can keep up. Yes, uh, I am now running. Obviously, I've had to make the I made the jump to Substack, of course. Um, so I'm over at theedition.substack.com. There's lots of tech stuff. There's lots of media. There you go, tech stuff, media stuff, culture stuff, all coming together, all added together there. So that's fun. Uh, my book is still available. Not buying it. Um, and the topic of fake news continues to feel quite pertinent. So yeah, and send me your dog photos on Twitter to at charlotteahenry.com. <laughs> Excellent. Well, good to have you on the show as always. Want to extend a special thanks also to Anthony Junk, who's one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. Thank you for the years of support. Anthony, gold star. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> and the crowd goes wild. Uh, there is a longer version of the show. It's called Good Day Internet. You might know all about it, but if you don't and you'd like an extended version of the show where we talk about all sorts of stuff, do become a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. We are live here on DTNS Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. And we're back doing it all again tomorrow. Scott Johnson joining us. Talk to you then. Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Chris Benito, Steve Iadarola, and Jeffrey Zilks. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>